Hello everyone, uh, this is Bruce Rain from Brankus Creations and thank you very much for joining me for this live stream. Um, anyone who is on the stream for the first time, anyone who's watching this uh, one of my streams for the first time, please jump onto the chat and say hello. Uh, please let me know if there are any problems with the image or the audio, if it is too loud, if it is too quiet, uh, if it is too opinionated, uh, please just let me know and I will... Uh, try and resolve that situation. Um, today's stream is about this little guy here, which is a Macintosh Plus analog board. Um, and it has a few problems. And if I just bring this up to the camera here, and let's see if I can get this to focus. I have a little manual focus tool here, which is something I haven't had before. And so we'll see how well this works. Uh, advanced focus. Oops. Let's go out to about so there. Uh, too, too far, too far. To there. Okay. I think that's reasonably viewable. Uh, you can see that we've got this cap here which has exploded. And that is a reefer cap or a safety capacitor. And for those not aware of what they are, oh, audio is popping, glitching a bit. Sounds like a dodgy cable. It probably is a dodgy cable. How about we get this over here and uh, make it so that it's not being affected by my movement. So, okay. Now, kaboom, sorry about that. I always seem to have audio problems, don't I? just my the bane of my existence uh, let me just check that testing one two three one two three okay yep that sounds okay so hopefully that is a little bit better so uh, anyhow i won't get out of my chair anymore because the uh, getting out of the chair part was i think the one that was making the sound go all crackly so um so as i say this is basically a macintosh plus analog board and we have just dropped something we have a uh, a reefer capacitor which has blown up now i'll uh Oh yes, kaboom to that board component indeed. So the just a very quick explanation about the whole concept of a class X and a class Y safety capacitor, because this is what they are. This has three, this has this big one as a class X, and then two little ones up here, which are class Y. Now what they are, uh, they are, what's the word? Um, they're, they're, they're essentially like filters. So they uh, smooth out if you've got if you've got a situation where you're connecting this to mains power and there might be spikes um they uh they help to sort of smooth that out and they're specifically designed to uh if there is a large enough spike to fail um and fail being sort of a, an interesting word in this instance because they do actually recover but anyhow what they do is they they fail closed what that means is they send that spike into the board and then should theoretically make the fuse pop and so this is why I expect this fuse will probably be gone in this as well. We'll probably have to replace that. Um, but they are, they are generally self-healing as well. So once they do spike and send the fuse, you know, make the fuse pop, they should still be able to work. Uh, but these old reefer paper capacitors, they have a limited lifespan and that, that's where they are now. They've reached the end of that lifespan and that's why they're all popping. And for those who are you know, maybe users of old Apple IIe computers. I mean, it's very, very common for those uh, power supplies to um, to uh, to fail. Now, the other ones we have are Class Y capacitors. They're also filters, but basically with those, they rather than them failing closed, they fail open. So when they fail, uh, they stop actually doing their job. They stop doing the filtering. So, so anyhow, um, if you want to know more information about these Class X and Class Y capacitors, by all means, jump onto the Google or consult an electronics um, you know, engineer about it. Uh, that's about all I know about them because at the end of the day, I'm a computer programmer. So um, anyhow, there are uh, the replacements readily available. You just have to remember, um, I very quickly need to say hello to everyone here that's been saying hello and they're popping on. I say uh, hello to Dysfunctional Wombat, uh, AKA Aaron. Hello, Dan. Hello, Steve. Uh, and hello, Jay, and uh, and samplers, samplers. Is that Rob? I think. Um, so uh, anyhow, um, hello to everyone, and thank you for joining me. Um, 
Now, the very important thing with safety capacitors, if you are going to replace safety capacitors, you must replace them with other safety capacitors. You can't just look at and go, oh, this is a 0.47 microfarad um, capacitor. I'm just going to go grab an electrolytic and put it in place. They have a very, very specific safety purpose, so you need to replace them with the same ones. So I have got here a replacement um, Class X safety capacitor, same rating as this one here. And then I have got two little replacement Class Y. Now these ones should theoretically not fail in the same way that these old paper ones do. Uh, it is very common for these paper ones to fail and fail quite spectacularly they do, you know, with smoke and fire and brimstone and all that sort of stuff. So um, I'll just uh, quickly jump across to the old uh, microscope here. This will be a little bit out of focus because of the way I've set this up, but uh, here you can kind of see the, uh, am I, yeah, I'm zoomed out as far as I can go. You can see the rather spectacular way in which they fail with all that gunk and and stuff. So anyhow, the uh, the next thing we need to do is we need to remove these um, these capacitors. And I'm also then going to go over the things that I do in order to um, uh, kind of just give these boards a, a check over. Um, it's very common for these old um, Mac Plus analog boards to end up with cracked solder joints, uh, specifically around the, uh, the either the flyback transformer, which is this fellow just here, uh, or around the uh, the sort of jumpers, the uh, sorry, the, uh, the the yeah, the plugs, the you know sort of plug hole thingies. Um, what's the word I'm looking for with those? But anyhow, the plugs. Um, so uh, so I generally go and uh, and have a look at those. I inspect those, and make sure there aren't any cracks in them, and if there are, I fix them up. Uh, oh, hello, John. Uh, an old friend of mine, John, has just joined. Hello, John. Thank you for joining. Um, this is an old Mac Plus board. Uh, should you know bring back some memories for you. Um, so, um, so now, uh, yeah. So the next thing I'm going to do is uh, I'll I'll take these capacitors off, and then uh, the next thing I'll do is I'll obviously replace them, and then we'll give the board a little bit of a once over. Now, one really important thing, this is an international board, which means it is a 240 volt board, which means that it does vary from the US board. Um, there are different components in different places. It's not all the same. So um, if you're using this as a, a guide, you can sort of think of it as a, a guide to maybe the processors, but don't use it as a guide to the components themselves, you know, because they are different on the US board to the international board. Uh, and one of the questions I regularly get asked is, can you take a US board and change it into an international, and whether you can take an international and change it into US. With the Mac Plus 128K, 512K, the short answer is no, not really, not easily. Um, I've never come across someone who has come up with a, a suitable, you know, sort of a really, a, a, um, you know, sort of a reasonable way of actually doing that. So that's just how it is. It's different if you're talking about a classic or a classic two, they can be altered, but these nah. Um, okay, so um, so let's let's begin. Um, this is you know there's nothing particularly interesting with this. This board, other than the this cap, is not in that bad a condition. Uh, I've seen some way way worse ones. Um, I might just quickly, if I have one, grab a a permanent marker, which I usually have here, but I can't find. Because I, what I usually like to do is I like to mark out, here it is, I like to mark out the pins um, so that I can then just look under the microscope and know which ones I'm going to be removing. And that's it, that one I think. And these two, even though these class Y caps are still fine and still in one piece, I'm going to replace them because one day they won't be fine and they won't be in one piece. Okay, all right, so I just marked all those out. <clears throat> okay, all right, Jay, enjoy your lasagna. Jay always has dinner commitments around this time. Okay, so let's jump across to the microscope. I'm afraid it's very, very humid here at the moment, so my microscope uh, is a little bit cloudy from all the moisture in the air, so uh, I apologize for that. Now I'm going to be removing the solder from these with a solder sucker, a great big gigantic solder sucker like this. Um, 
I wouldn't do this if there was damage to these traces because it's likely to lip, rip the trace off as well. Um, and, uh, oh, when I return, I will be curious to hear the story about the thumb bandages. All right, well, I'll save that. Save that for when he comes back. Um, it's a very, very interesting story. It's not actually, but, you know, let's pretend it is. All right, so... We're just going to apply some solder here. Sorry, apply some heat here. Melt that solder and suck it. Oh, geez. There's always the phone. Um, okay, so that's that's that. And then up to this one here with my little black mark on it. And we'll do the same. And, whoop. Hey, right, you got to prime this thing again. <laughs> okay. There we go. I might hit that one with another one. Uh, might need to clean this, what do you reckon? Okay. There we go, that's looking good. Now, I don't want to just yank this out because I'm a little bit concerned about the um, the way that's bent over and I don't want to potentially um, damage the board as I remove it. So I'm just going to bend this up a little bit so the capacitor will come out a little bit easier. And do the same with this one. Well, that one's actually lifting the pad a little bit, but I'm going to have to solder that. Yeah, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll get a little bit of uh, what do you call this thing? Um, uh, braid solder braid, a bit of wick to just try and soak up a little bit more solder from under this pin here. There we go, so that I can tear that away without doing any damage. Oh, look at this. I'm not even on camera. <sighs> As I have explained before on my uh, streams, that when I look through this microscope, I see a lot more than gets broadcast. Uh, I see a great big circle, but what ends up in the picture here is uh, a rectangle. So um, a, a lot of it that I'm sort of seeing, you can't actually see. So I, if I'm not paying attention, I then... Um, I then just work away and uh, you can't actually see what I'm doing. So for that, I apologize. All right, so let's go with these other ones. Okay, there's that one there. And as I uh, said before, I mean, look, I have said in my streams before that there are you know, a couple of ways of being able to get the solder off the old, uh, uh, the old pins. One way is, of course, with that solder sucker. Another is using solder braid like this. As you can see, this is braided copper that... Um, uh, that is impregnated with um, a bit of uh, flux, and um, and then uh, and it sucks all that solder up. So let me just put that there. It's my first live stream in quite a while. I I feel like I'm a little bit out of practice. I need to uh, maybe do these a little bit more uh, more often. Okay. Just sucking up that solder. And last one here. Yep. Okay. Because one of the things with the old Mac Plus, Mac 128K, um, 512K, is of course none of them had fans. Um, so a lot of these did end up with overheating and you will actually notice certain places um, that there are very visible signs of excessive heat um, particularly around certain components I'll point those out generally it's not a problem you don't really have to worry too much about that I mean just because it's hot doesn't mean that it's not working properly some of these components just run hot um, for example I will just uh, quickly jump across to here um, there is a little, or a big, 5 watt resistor just here, and that always runs super hot. And it's not uncommon to see burning on the other side of the board, just where that is. Um, so, uh, yep. All right. So, let's now um, free the board, liberate the board of these horrendous capacitors. Here's the class Y. There's the second class Y coming out now. And then here's our big fat class X. 
and <laughs> we'll have a look at the board in a moment, but boy, oh boy, this one did go quite spectacularly, didn't it? I mean, uh, that's, uh, that's some gorgeous goo going on there. Um, so, uh, yeah, we won't be uh, reusing this. Now, I'll just show you a couple of things that are quite important if you're looking to replace any of these, any of these yourself in the future. I'm just going to jump across back onto the microscope. Um, so here we are looking at our rather gross and disgusting um, uh, capacitor. Now, one of the big problems we have with this, of course, is it's so dirty. But if I can just try and try and clean this a smidge. Um, so, oh, that's good, Steve. I'm glad. I want to see, you know, I like to see as many Mac Pluses still going. I, I have to say, I have incredible nostalgia associated with the Mac Plus. And one of the reasons for that, I mean, a lot of people talk about how much like they like the SE30 and all that sort of thing. And I, and I get that. The SE30 is a great machine, you know, powerful for a compact Mac and all that. But if you look at the 128K and the 512K, almost like a um, proof of concept. So in other words, we are bringing this graphical user interface to the people. And you look at what it brought in terms of, you know, sort of menus and cursor and files and folders and all that. You sort of think, yeah, look, this is this is the world changing. The computer world, the, the you know, personal computer world changing in front of us. You, you know, we accept that. But at the same time, I feel like they were, a, you know, again, a bit of a proof of concept. By the time they got to the Mac Plus, which I think was 1986, obviously the first one in 1984, and then in 1986, the Mac Plus came out. By the time they got to the Mac Plus, I felt like they were really starting to get it right. And some of the really important additions were, first of all, the ability to expand up to four megabytes of RAM, which at the time was a lot of RAM. And, you know, 128K, 512K was just pretty pathetic, especially when there was no real expansion built into those things. Um, the... Um, uh, the other thing was, of course, the addition of SCSI on the Mac Plus, which then gave you the ability to attach external hard drives, scanners, you know, whatever. I mean, I can attach a CD-ROM drive to one of these old things if I want to. So, you know, that for me, I really, I, I've got a real fondness for the Mac Plus. The, um, you know, I, I've sort of, they have a real special place in my heart. So I do like to try and keep as many of these going as possible. So back to the old microscope here. And what I'm basically doing is I'm just cleaning this up a little bit with a cotton bud slash Q-tip slash cotton swab. Uh, and you might think, why on earth are you doing that? Well, the reason is I wanted to actually just show you this here. It's not easy to see, but there are some numbers here. You just have to trust me, there are some numbers here. Let me grab one of these little class wires because I can demonstrate it better with that. On these safety capacitors, you have these numbers, which are, you can see there's that 40 slash 085 slash 56. Um, those codes, if you do a Google search on them, they will tell you what you need to replace, you know, this the capacitor with. Obviously this has this up on the front here. It has 4,700 picofarads, uh, which I, I think there are, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, there are, I think a thousand nanofarads in a microfarad and there are a million picofarads in a microfarad. I think that's correct. But uh, And so there's that. But as I say, you will actually get more information if you do, do a Google search on these numbers here. So anyhow, these ones have numbers as well, but they're just impossible to read. So let's check out sort of ground zero on this board because I think it's going to be quite interesting. Um, I've just got to lower the microscope, I'm afraid, because I have to lift it up in order to uh, um, to look at the other side of it. All right, so there's our fuse um, looking uh, a little bit on the grubby side. And I'm just going to grab my, uh, my little multimeter here, set on beep mode. Um, hello to retro, retro red drum, retro red drum. Um, uh, and uh, thank you for joining me from Canada. I appreciate that. Um, is it retro red room? Um, as in red room is in like from the shining, you know, um, murder backwards. I don't know. I'm just, I don't know. I'm guessing. Okay. So let's just check the, well, first of all, that the multimeter is on that always works better if it's on. Okay, there's a beep. Instant yeep mode. There we go. I better not steal Steve's yeep. There'll be uh, copyright issues. Okay. Well, look at that. 
The fuse is still fine, so aren't we lucky? We exploded without wrecking the fuse, but we might want to clean it a little. Shining fan, there you go. See, I know my popular culture. Um, okay, so I'm going to just take this fuse out, um, mainly because it's just, I would like to clean it. I might even replace it because, let's face it, I mean, it's gross. And here we are. It's basically just gunk. I'm going to just have to clean that up a little bit. I'm going to use a toothbrush for that um, and just get in here and try and get some of this black gunk off, make it look a little bit more presentable. Um, I have full expectation that once I've replaced this, uh, these, you know, these safety capacitors, that this will work, um, that it will come up working um, well. So uh, there we go. This is this is this is great. So I, what I'm cleaning this with is I've got uh, one of these little containers that they sort of use for, um, you know, I think they use them for like makeup and stuff. You know, if they're cleaning makeup, I mean, like make off remover or something, and you just press down and and then you get the gunk on it. And this is isopropyl alcohol. This is 99.9% .9 isopropyl alcohol. And for uh, for uh, anyone who's doing sort of any board repair work, I would highly recommend having some isopropyl alcohol on hand. It's great stuff. Um, and, uh, you know, clean stuff up. And then, of course, it dries away nice and quickly and easily. Um, so just doing that there. Now, one of the other things I often do when I'm working on a Mac Plus board is I replace one of the capacitors, or sorry, one of the resistors, and I'm just going to point to it now. Now, this is different on the US board, so it's a different number. So this is really just for the um, international boards. Oh, when the alcohol gets to the fresh cut under the uh, under the Band-Aid. Ouchie. Um, okay, so this here is R55. It's a 33 kilo ohm resistor and it what i find really interesting about this is if you look at the screen printing on the board you can see how the screen print the size of that screen printing there you now is in from there to there it's designed for i guess probably a, a quarter watt uh, resistor to go on there here the screen printing is really big with the expectation they were maybe going to stick like a, a half watt or a one watt sort of uh, resistor on there but it's still another little tiny resistor on there. I mean, it might be a different wattage, but it's still a little teeny weeny one. This resistor has the tendency to get incredibly hot. Uh, and obviously with a device that has no fan, that can potentially be a problem. So what I often do when I work with these is I actually go and replace that with a nice big one watt resistor, um, which you're probably not gonna be able to see there. Um, so I will do that for this one as well. So uh, just let's call it just a bit of future proofing to try and sort of protect it. Um, right, 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 right. Okay, so just getting rid of the last of this gunk here. I mean, I'm not going to go too crazy with the cleaning of this. Um, I just want to get the majority of that gunk off. Um, I generally don't put analog boards in the ultrasonic cleaner. I have done for ones that have been bad enough. Obviously, when we're talking about the Mac Plus, if you're going to stick this in an ultrasonic cleaner, one thing you do need to do is take the speaker off, because otherwise that speaker will obviously get wrecked this, the moment you submerge it in liquid. But um, it is. Uh, but I have in the past, when I've had an analog board that is bad enough and grubby enough, that I uh, take that speaker off and then uh, um, drop it into the ultrasonic cleaner. But I really do not want to do that with this one. Uh, so I'm just going to try and get this as clean as I can without the need for uh, for that. Uh, now, another thing I should also mention is that I generally don't recap these unless there's evidence of a capacitor failure. Um, it's a very different story to if we were recapping one of the newer ones, one of the one, ones made after the capacitor plague, which of course, for those who aren't aware, they were when there was a whole bunch of dodgy capacitors coming out of Taiwan. Uh, so, um, uh, so yeah, these, these are generally pretty good. I mean, sometimes, yes, a capacitor will fail, but I've found with these ones, when I get ones that are broken, it's not usually the capacitors that have failed. It's usually sort of, uh, resistors, um, you know, sort of transistors, uh, you know, oh, and reefer capacitors, obviously safety capacitors, they, they do, they do count as a capacitor. I realize that. All right, so this one ain't looking too bad now. Uh, it's a little bit cleaner. Let's just jump across onto the old microscope and have a look. You can see there's still a little bit of gunge in there, but 
but on the whole it's looking a lot cleaner than it was. I might just try a little bit more in there. Yep. It looks all right until you look at it in the microscope. There we go. Boy, oh boy. Look at that baked on gunge there. Baked on gunge and grime. There we go. Right. Okay, so next thing. Replace the capacitor. Um, and uh, with a little bit of luck, these holes should even line up. If they don't, I've got another one where I do know they do line up. <laughs> oh, that feels, it feels fairly liney uppy. In you go. Sorry, this is uh, not particularly interesting to watch, but this is absolutely impossible to do with a microscope. Impossible. And of course, the thing is that I don't see too good. So uh, I find this very hard to do. I'm just going to grab myself some extra light here. Yeah, yeah. There we go. All right. So, capacitor, safety capacitor is in. Lovely, shiny blue one there. Maybe doesn't look original, but you know. Um, just worth mentioning that the you can actually get paper capacitor replacements. You can get new reefer caps, but um i you know i mean unless someone specifically said to me hey i want you to replace it with a you know with an old uh, reefer paper one i would always put on a nice new a nice new one like this it doesn't look like it's going to explode in years to come all right so let's just make sure this is in focus and we can just watch the joys of exciting soldering using my uh Hacko FX951 soldering iron. Links are in the description in case you feel like buying one. Um, if you do buy one, please use the link in the description because I get a little piece of that. Um, and uh, there is also a budget alternative in the description, uh, which is a soldering iron which is far cheaper but still uses these T12 tips that you get from the hacker, and you can buy those T12 tips separately. Um, oh yes, lovely bird song. That is actually, um, that's actually uh, a, a horrible uh, Indian miner, I'm afraid. <laughs> it's one of those terrible introduced birds. But anyhow, um, all right, so let's go clean that up a little bit. So that's basically soldered in now. And then we need to do the same with our little class Y capacitor. Just gonna feed these in. Uh, don't, yeah, don't forget to like the video. Thank you, Steve, for reminding folks. Here's Steve, um, the uh, uh, one of the other members of the Mac Yak group, which of course we will be. Uh, uh, we our show will be on tomorrow, so uh, please don't forget to jump on and listen to us yak about Max. But Steve will be streaming, I believe, directly after I have finished streaming. Um, and I don't want to give anything away, but he'll be working on a vintage computer as well. So please, when you finish watching my stream, jump across and watch his stream or jump across to his channel now and uh, subscribe. And, uh, and then you may or may not get a YouTube notification because that's how YouTube notifications work. Um, and, uh, and then jump on and watch his stream afterwards. I know I will be because I know what he's going to be looking at and it's one of my favorite computers. So. Um, right, what caps are you using as replacements for the reefer? So uh, I am actually using, they're basically Class X, I think they're, are they polymer? I can't remember, I'll need to look them up. I will put links to them in the description, but they are basically essentially modern replacements 
for the old paper caps. They still do the same job. They still have the same rating. They are still designed to work the same, provide the same level of safety. Um, but these modern ones do tend to last longer. I mean, even to some extent, when you look at this, um, uh, this is a, this here is a polymer capacitor. I think it's polymer, correct me if I'm wrong, if there's anyone, this here is a polymer capacitor. And this is still going strong. In actual fact, this is an earlier Mac, um, Mac Plus analog board. The later ones all use these sorts of polymer capacitors as the safety caps. And I've never known any of those ones to fail. It's only those paper capacitors, those, um, you know, sort of those reefers that fail. So, you know, um, this is how I know that this is probably a fairly early revision of the Mac Plus. It's certainly a beige case rather than a gray one. I know these days they're all beige because of the yellowing of the plastic. But, you know, in the early days, the very first Mac Plus was beige. And then they released a later one, which was gray. Um, and the way you can tell which one they are is generally if you take the cover off the uh, battery and look at the underside of that, you can usually you, know, you can usually tell if it's sort of still grey, um, sort of on the inside of the battery cover on the back. All right, exciting stuff. More soldering to do, and let's just jump across to the old microscope here. I hope that's yeah, it's reasonably in focus. All right. Um, yeah, no, I'm sorry. It's not a TAM uh, you'll, you, that Steve's going to be working on. And, I'll, uh, and of course, if you know the sorts of computers I like, you'll know that um, if I was saying it was one of my favorites, I would not be referring to a TAM. Got nothing against the 20th anniversary Mac. I don't, I don't have anything against it, but it is not one of my favorites. My favorites tend to be a lot older than that. Um, my favorites tend to relate to the computers that I used to use back when I was a young fella and I used to do, I used to work in a, um, a design studio type situation. Uh, it did other, did other things as well. Um, and, uh, and so, uh, yeah, I, I really like the computers that I used to use back in those days. So, all right. Last one. What I'm generally doing when I'm soldering these on, I get the solder onto the pin uh, and then I put my hand underneath and I just push the component up so that it's nice and flush with the board and make sure it's not hanging out. Uh, yeah, film caps and uh, Apple II, Apple II film. See, I've been calling them paper caps the whole time. They're bloody film caps. Um, so, uh, yes, the... Um, yes, in the Apple II power supplies, that's exactly right. They're the same problem. Uh, Reefer, reefer has become like a dirty word, you know. I mean, it's like, oh yeah, reefer caps, and everyone just associates them with blowing up. So that's just how it goes. All right, paper film. That I think that's are they paper film? I think something like that. So uh, all right, so I have. Oh, sorry, I'm just making everyone sick with the microscope going around there. Sorry. So I have these in place now. So there's our two. Ouch! Oh, alcohol in that cut again. Um, I have two of the class Y down here and then the replaced class X there. And in theory, we're not going to need to worry about them anymore. Now, I mentioned before that I am also going to replace a resistor, which is this one here. It's a known weak point. I've actually had um, analog boards of some of these old Macs where they've been totally dead and it's been like, oh, can this be fixed? And it was that one capacitor. That was all it was. Just, sorry, I keep saying capacitor. It's a resistor. There was that one resistor just there. Um, so, and that was all that was needed to uh, to bring bring it back to life. So, given that it is a known weak point, I like to, with these, in the interest of future proofing, um, you know, sort of uh, put in a new one, a new resistor. So, zooming down here, and we are looking at this one here, and you can't see that. I'm not getting very good with the uh, camera changing back and forward, am I? I'm, I'm forgetting. Um, yes, Max Allen Reef are the two dirty words for the Apple collectors, that's for sure. And Oh, Vata, of course, yes. Yeah, so let's not forget uh, Vata uh, are the same. Do -do -do. Do -do -do. Let me just jump across here and check something here. I'd like to have a quick look. 
Oh, 10 concurrent viewers. Hello, 10 people. Um, and I'm out of camera again. Here we go. Just sucking up some solder. Is this something to do with your computer? Right. Let's oops, let's do the same. I like to, as I say, have said before, I like to bend these pins up before I just yank them out. I just feel it's with an old board like this, it's a lot safer. And bendy bendy. There we go. And then out comes our little 33 kilo ohm resistor there woo and then here's the great big fat replacement they're going to be putting in uh, this one's future proofing okay um, and once again just be aware that this is R55 on the international board but it's not on the US board all right new resistor on uh, on the board and then we'll come back here and do some more soldering. Yep. And this um, is probably not going to be a particularly long stream today. You'll all be very pleased to hear. Uh, because to be honest, this board really doesn't look that bad. I don't expect to have any problems with it. There are a couple of things that, that stand out at a glance when I look at this and I'll point them out but just in the scooting this board around here um, I have noticed I'll just cut those pins away I've noticed that someone has already had a go at this board uh, which is good in many ways because it means we probably won't have some of the issues these boards have it's very common with the boards of this age that when you put them in uh, you know when you fire it up you um, you get either no screen and then you whack it on the side and then the screen comes on or you get flickering uh, and all of that is related to or sometimes you get no picture and then when they warm up you get a picture and that is basically to do with um, cracked solder joints as these joints get old you have the pin coming up the middle you have the solder going around the outside and over time through vibrations or weight of whatever it is um, that pin starts to work away from the solder around it and you end up with this little gap around it and then it's not making proper contact and when the the board warms up it sometimes means those things expand and then they make contact again so that's why when you have a situation where you've got a a computer that is sort of like not working or works better when it's warmed up i would always be looking for cracked solder joints and a mac plus board i would expect if it hadn't been if the, no work had been done to it i would expect several cracked solder joints but as I've just jumped around here before I've noticed that they look like they've already been done so that's kind of good in that it makes life easy for me but it's bad in that I can't demonstrate a cracked solder joint so this is the flyback transformer and this has a bit of weight on the board and this is why this one sometimes gets cracked solder joints but looking at these these joints really don't look too bad at all I don't see any cracks in those this one here is maybe could pay, maybe have a little bit extra solder now, what, 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 I need, oh, I've got to get further up. Oh, 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 heavy microscope. Okay. All right. So I'm just going to probably add a little bit of solder to that one, just to potentially avoid a future crack. Yeah, uh, look, I would say that um, um, if you have a Mac Plus, uh, and you have a you know, and you haven't gone in and had a look for cracked solder joints. Do it because, as I say, I see them all the time. Um, so, but I'm just going to have a look around. I mean, I would love to find one to demonstrate, but as I say, this one, where I would most commonly find it, is on J1. This is one here. This is the one that connects to the uh, to the yoke of the CRT, and it's the one with four pins. And I should really go to this one so I'm a bit bigger so that is this guy it's all so hard to do this this guy here is with the four pins there that I most commonly see cracked solder joints on the other side of that so I'll just jump across and I'll show you something 
uh, and is the reason why um, I sort of um, I think this has been done before. As you can see here, there's been some burning around here, and then someone's put some great big globs of solder on there. So this has been checked, and it has actually had new solder put on it. Now, I don't really see a need to go in and do that again. I don't see any cracking going on there at all. But, oh, I've got a little ant. Look at that, a little dead ant in there. Look about that? Um, it's amazing what you find in old computers, isn't it? Uh, now, if I was to be replacing, you know, if I was to be sorting out a cracked solder joint, generally what I do, these boards are really cumbersome to work with because they've got all the stuff hanging off the bottom, so they're hard to lay flat, which is why I'm having so much trouble keeping this still. Let's see if I can just bring this down a bit. There we go. Right. So if I was to be replacing the solder on one of these, I'll just, I will actually do it on one of these. What I would generally do is not just add more solder. I like to take the old solder away, either with a, you know, the solder sucker or with, um, um, or with the solder braid. And what I would generally do with these, I would hold my soldering iron on the end of the um, on the end of the pad and push down, because that way, if I'm sucking it up, I don't you know accidentally suck the whole pad up. So I'm going to be almost holding this pad down with my soldering iron and then. There we go. And then you can uh, see the pin poking up through the middle there. Um, now, I would normally expect that pin to be further through, so I'm a little bit concerned that this might have lifted up off the board a bit. Let me just, I'm just going to have a quick look here. Uh, and well, that's interesting. It looks like it might have even been glued at some stage. Can you see that there? Some sort of gunk there. Yeah, I think that has actually been glued at some stage. So it makes it a little bit difficult for me because I don't think I can get that perfectly flush on the board. But having said that, um, I still think we've got enough of the pin there for it to make good contact, but I just would have preferred that to be poking through a little bit more. Okay, so, as I said, I took that solder away, took the old solder away, then I'm gonna add some new stuff, make sure that the pin gets nice and hot, and then just add the solder, until we know that's all making good contact there. So that's what I would be doing if it was crack, but it, it's not crack. It's going well, thanks, Jay. Welcome back. How was the lasagna? You have lasagna a lot. Nothing wrong with that. I love lasagna, but... Um, in fact, I think I'd like some lasagna. Okay. Now, just looking around here again for any crack solder joints. I'm not seeing any at this particular stage. They all look pretty good. What I have seen, though, is a bit of blackness going on in this joint here. Um, now, what I might do is just clean that up a little bit. Oh, good, an exquisite lasagna. That's what we want from lasagna. Okay, so I'm just going to do what I did, did before. I'm just going to suck the solder away from this one here. Boop, like that. And then whack some new solder onto it there. Um, which I've hidden. And I bet you I've hidden it under the board. Yep, I have. Oi. So let's put this on here. So we're going to be very ready for testing soon. So as I say, not a particularly long stream by the looks of it. I mean, unless, of course, I fire it up and it doesn't work. But, you know, if that happens, I might just cry and run away. So, yeah, I mean, here I can see these aren't, these aren't original joints. These have been done afterwards. So someone has basically come in and, and re-soldered these. Um, there's nothing wrong with them. I mean, I'm not having a dig at anyone who's who actually did that. It's uh, The joints look fine, but it just does mean that part of the work that I would normally be doing with this has already been done by someone. Um, so the areas you would typically check would be where all of the plugs are. So you've got one plug here in the middle. I've got to jump back here again. You've got this plug here in the middle you got this plug up here and you've got this plug up here there 
Um, and so I would typically be looking at uh, all of those. And again, these have been done too. That's, that's, um, oh God, I've done this again. Microscope. These are um, this row here. They've all been done by someone before. So uh, look at someone stealing my glory to taking away all of the fun that I would have had in this live stream by doing all the work for me already. How dare they? How dare they? So um, from my perspective, I think we're probably fine. I think the next thing to do would just be fire this up and test it. Um, just going to clean it up a little bit here. Have a quick look at this. I might just add some solar to this because it looks a bit ugly. Look at that. I don't want someone looking at that and thinking, oh, look at the work he did. <clears throat> Make that look a little bit nicer. Nice, smooth joint. Look at that. See it? You can see it hardening there. I love that. Okay, so there we go. That joint looks much, much prettier now. There will be no ridicule. Ow! Oh, alcohol in thumb. Ouch. Um, so... Okay, well I think... Yep, I think that's it. I think it's time to test. As I said before, this plug wasn't really flush. This is the little plastic bit that would normally be poking through the, other, you know, through the board. It would normally be sticking a lot further through, which indicates that that plug is not um, flat flush. I don't think it will, that will cause a problem, but that's, uh, <clears throat> that's just the situation there. Okay, so time for testing, I guess. Um, I don't really think I will do anything else at this stage. I mean, I might if it doesn't work, but uh, I think at this stage we can uh, move to the testing phase. So microscope out of the way for that. Move, thank you. And then I'll need to get the computer up here. Just pop that down out of the way for a moment. About that thumb band-aid, yeah, I cut myself this morning while I was cutting up some, I, I, when I was feeding the chickens, I feed the chickens in the morning, I give them some treats, I get some cucumber, and I get some, uh, uh, some sometimes some tomato, or maybe a bit of corn, and I cut them up and sprinkle them out for the chooks to have, uh, chickens, sorry. Chooks is a sort of a, a Australian Britishism of chickens. So I, I, when I'm feeding the chickens, I, yeah, I chop up some of this uh, cucumber. In this morning, while I was uh, chopping up, I got a little bit complacent with my great big chef, chef's knife, and sliced a little bit off my thumb, which was uh, really clever of me. So uh, here is the inside of the Mac Plus with our CRT, and of course, one of the things you'll always notice about the uh, Mac Plus is the fact that there's a lot of vacant space in here because it didn't have a hard drive. So you've know, got all that space underneath there. Now, of course, it's very vacant at the moment because it doesn't have an analog board connected. Uh, and this is the plug I was talking about before. This is the, the plug that goes to that J1 that's going through into this yoke there. Uh, and, uh, and then that's the other plug there. And here's my little Ziploc bag with all the screws because that's how I do things so I don't lose my customer's stuff. Um, okay, schnitty, schnitty. Chicken schnitty. See, as uh, I've been teaching uh, Jay some of our Australianisms here, and for anyone who uh, doesn't know what a schnitty is, it is a chicken schnitzel. And if you're not sure what that is, it's um, uh, what we would call a bit of flattened crumbed chicken that's shallow fried, but I think uh, the term in America is breaded. Um, so anyhow, um, very popular food out here. Right, so I'm gonna just move this camera down a little smidge so we can see my fat gut and a bit more of the Mac Plus as well. All right, there we go. There's our Mac Plus. And we need to fit this board in here. We've got two little sort of metal slot things here which line up with two little notches there. Uh, one of the things that happens quite commonly with these analog boards when you're trying to put them in is the, the, the brightness knob falls off. So just be always be mindful of that when you're putting them in place. So we're gonna slide that in there, get the get that into there. There we go. And that's in. Now I'm uh, not going to attach all of the screws, but I will attach a couple just to hold it all in place. Let's twist it around that way so we can kind of see. Um, 
let's get some of these screws out and then I'll need a screwdriver won't I I mean that just goes without saying um, I need to find oh here he is screwdriver okay cucumber is dangerous I cut my thumb on the julienne dicer the other day making sushi yeah I, I'll tell you I mean we need to start banning cucumber from schools um, and uh, because you know the, the the risk to life and limb is just is just terrible. Um, okay, and what do we got here? You're making me hungry. Might go get a schnitty burger for lunch. Yeah, actually, I'm making myself hungry. I'd love a schnitty. <gasps> Yum. I can't go out though. I've got someone dropping in a whole bunch of computers for repair later today. I'm getting a portable Mac portable dropped off for repair or recapping. And a 2VX, of course the, uh, you know, they just keep turning up the old 2VXs. I mean, they're not a particularly good computer, but, you know, um, uh, the one good thing about them, I suppose, is they were, I think, one of the first uh, sort of consumer level um, Apple computers that had a uh, CD-ROM drive. But they're just an old, very old, slow 68030 CPU. And what else? There's something else coming can't remember but anyhow more repairs yeah i've got so many repairs at the moment i mean seriously if i was streaming them all i would never leave this office um there are just mountains of repairs here at the moment which is great can't complain um all right so i'm plugging everything back in here on the analog board which you can't see because it's hidden so um let's uh i've already connected up the uh, uh anode cap from the uh flyback transformer to the CRT I did that you know without even showing you which is just terrible of me isn't it so let me uh should I do, do it again should I should I okay there there's the anode cap and that's giving it now of course goes without saying that if you have one of these and you are planning to remove the analog board that you need to discharge the CRT so that you don't hurt yourself um so uh, if you jump onto my channel, you'll see that there is a video on how to discharge the CRT. Uh, and I would highly recommend you watch that before you decide to delve into the guts of one of these computers. So uh, uh, let's, I'm trying to make this so that you guys can see it, but at the same time, then I can't see it at all. So there's our J1 going in and there's our J something. Can't see it. Is our J something going in? Uh, yeah. There we go. Now, if anyone has uh, one of these and they are playing around inside them, um, will you make a video on the portable? Would make a great recap video. Short answer: Yes, I will. Um, it's they don't come across my desk very often, so uh, I will definitely be making a recapping video of that. Um, so yeah. So. If, any, if you are delving around in the side of the inside of these, just be incredibly careful of, of me not showing you what I'm talking about, of this. Uh, because this is a vacuum, obviously, and they suck the air out from the end here and then they put a little glass cap on it, a little glass nipple. And if you snap that glass, the air will suck out and then you, 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 there's no repair path for that. You just have to replace the CRT. Um, now, you can find spares around, but it's just a lot easier to not break it in the first place. So... Just be super, super, super careful of that. Um, all right. So, um, incidentally, I am going around just touching things in this with no fear, with complete impunity. And that is because this has been off for a long time. Um, and, uh, and so nothing is holding charge anymore. Uh, so it's all, you know, we're all safe. Once I've switched it on, it'll be a different story. Um, I'll be a lot more careful. But, uh, but just, you know, letting you know. And the other thing, of course, to be very mindful of is if you're working on one of these that doesn't have the plastic cover on the, on this, like this one doesn't, there's live, live voltage all around here. So just, you know, if you're powering it up with that cover off, be unbelievably careful because, you know, you can really write yourself off um, by just touching the wrong thing around here. I've actually done it before, not on purpose, but I did do it and it was not a lot of fun. Um, so, but I'm still here and I learned a lesson. All right, so, okay, I think it's all, it's all good. 
we've got these little adjustment pots in here um, and you've got adjustments for focus and brightness and you know uh, voltage and all that sort of stuff the, I do actually have a cover here it's not it's not the cut oh, what's a color classic a, a classic color that's useless um, I'm pretty sure I have a plus cover here somewhere yes I do yes I do here it is that's what a cover looks like that sits on there and that tells us what all of these little things adjust from here so we've got uh, cutoff focus width height and voltage generally with these I would always check the voltage um, we'll be looking forward to seeing the portable can't wait yeah I mean they suck I mean I'd love one don't get me wrong but they're you know they they're a pretty crappy computer they always were um, but that's, I think, one of the reasons why they're so collectible now, because, um, you know, they, they really were a bit of a lemon. I mean, you know, how heavy were they and unreliable, <laughs> all that sort of stuff. But anyhow, that's another story. But yes, I would love one. I'd love to own one, but I, I don't know that I'll ever be able to because they're so friggin' expensive. Um, all right, so I think I'm all connected. I'm just double checking everything here because I do get a little bit sidetracked sometimes when I'm doing these live streams and I don't want to forget to plug something in. And... Somewhere here, uh, I have a, uh, what do you call that thing? Um, um, uh, not SCSI to SD, the other one. VZ Emu, VZ Emulator. No, not VZ Emu, that's an emulator. Um, what do you call them? E floppy Emu, Floppy Emu, there you go. Um, and it's here, I brought it down, I just don't know where I put it. Oh, here it is. Okay, so this is an older one um, but it is a floppy emulator and this allows you to connect into the floppy port of this computer and it will emulate a uh, either a floppy disk or one of the original HD 20 SCSI drives or they weren't SCSI sorry they were hard drives that connected to the floppy port of these old computers um, and so I've actually got one here, I think I'm pretty sure with a, 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 a Mac Plus compatible operating system on it. Now I will need a mouse, and the reason I'll need a mouse is because you need to shut these down. If you just switch the computer off without shutting them down, it tends to corrupt the, um, the disk image file. So I need to shut it down. So I need to get a mouse. So we'll turn this into pantomime. Where's my Mac Plus mouse? It's behind you. Here it is. Okay, so um, there we go. Plug in the mouse. Plug in the floppy emu. Oh, yep, that's the right word. I thought I got it wrong again, but yes, the floppy emu. Um, let's turn this around so we can see it. Um, does it let you read 1.4 megabyte disk images or is it limited to 800 kilobyte disk images? Pretty sure it allows you to do 1.4, but only on the computers that can read a 1.4 um, someone might sort of be able to double check that and correct but if you're talking about a computer like this which will only read 800k discs I don't think the ROMs will accept a 1.4 megabyte disk image I think that is the case I could be wrong I'm pretty sure that um, you need to uh, yeah you know a 1.4 will work on a computer that reads 1.4 discs so there we go now, uh, oh, and look, another thing, I've talked about SCSI uh, to SDs many times in the past, and as you know, I do like SCSI to SDs, um, they're very good, but I would say for a Mac Plus, I would probably lean towards this, unfortunately they're not super cheap, but I really do like these on the old Mac Plus 128K, 512K, I've only got the one that I share between the uh, those computers, but um, yeah. Do they work with the Apple IIgs? Yes, yes, I'm pretty sure they do. Uh, and the Apple IIe. Um, so, uh, and they work with the Lisa as well, for anyone out there with uh, an exciting old Lisa. Right, okay, so this is the moment of truth. We've done this. Um, either explosions or victory awaits. So, I'm plugging in mains power. And as, as I said before, there's nothing covering this, so I'm being super careful at the moment because I really do not want to top myself in a live stream. I think that would probably, I don't know, I might get more subscribers, but I don't think it's a good idea. Um, all right, so that goes in. And then um, that's plugged in and that's there. And we're ready, we're ready, are we ready? 
and nothing happened. <gasps> guess what I forgot? Can you guess what I forgot? It's fairly important. There's something that I removed at the beginning and I didn't put it back. <laughs> um, and it looks like that. And I'm going to replace it with a new one. So, anyhow, let me just uh, move this out of the way so that I can um, do this properly. Forgot to plug in the power cord. No, I remember to plug in the power cord, but I did remove the fuse earlier on and I failed to put the fuse back. Now, because the fuse is disgusting and scungy, um, let me just jump across here to do this. And I'm going to go to microscope big and then let's have a look at this and see what it is here's a oh. i just got to clean it okay so that looks to me like it is a 1.6 amp 250 volt so let's go back now very quickly and find a suitable replacement. This has got the little box of tricks. Six amp, 50 volt. That'd be a bit of an issue. Um, 2.5 amp. That's too much. 3.15 amp, that's too much. 1.6, was it 1 point, it was, it is a 1.6 amp, huh, I would have expected one bigger, I may end up having to put this one back in, because I'm not sure I actually have a replacement, uh, bear with me just a moment, I'm going to probably make a crackle, because I'm going to move the uh, microphone and everything, so just a second, you can have a look at my scungy area around there, I'm looking in my other parts of drawers to see if I can find a 1.6 uh, and as I say finding that I will put this other one in I will replace it with a new one but for the purposes of the testing I will put the old one back in uh, 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 uh. Yeah. okay I'm putting the old one back in for the purpose of testing and then I'll put in a new one at a later date all right <clears throat> Sorry about that. I would have loved to have just pulled out the right one and put it in there. All right. Now, let's get back to here. This is, uh, this is heavy, but not quite as heavy as the SE30. So it's not a Merlin's beard sort, he sort of heavy. All right. So uh, can I get this in here without having to take the analog board out? Uh, and we'll soon find out. Mm. Eh. Come on, come on. How costly are those microscopes? Uh, it depends which part of the world you're buying them from. You will actually find a link in the description where you can click on that link and it will take you to the Amazon page and it will have a price there for you. Um, so if you are thinking about buying one, I'm going to lie this on its side. It will be a lot easier for me to put in that way. Um, there are cheaper alternatives. Uh, this one is quite expensive because of the whole big rig that's, that is here. Um, there are ones that have a smaller um, uh, mount, you know, sort of, uh, you know, this thing uh, is smaller. And so they don't, um, uh, they're, not, uh, they're not, you know, they're not quite as pricey. The most important thing is that there is clearance underneath. If you look at a standard microscope, they're designed to be like that far away from whatever you're looking at. You know, with a microscope like this, this is much higher, which you've got hands to room for your hands to work underneath. So, um, uh, but they are really, really important. They're, um, yeah, I mean, I think here in Australia, I think this one cost me about, uh, I, I can't remember exactly, but I think it was like 800 plus dollars. It was probably getting close to a thousand. But I had to get it brought in from America by the time, pay for shipping and all that sort of stuff. It was quite pricey. So, um, 
but it's very, very important. And this one is referred to as a trinocular microscope, meaning that it has three viewports. It actually only has two, a left and a right eye, which allows you to see sort of stereoscopic through it. But um, one of the uh, view, one of the eyepieces, uh, it's sort of gets split off and you can attach a camera to it. And that's how I then stream what I'm looking at. Um, eh. This this is like the fiddliest process because I am now trying to put this in with the board, the analog board out, and it's not that easy. But I'm feeling good about, yeah, that got in. In we go. Whoa, push too far down. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the cost of a microscope like this sort of seems absurd and prohibitively expensive, and it is depending on what you're doing. I mean, if you're just doing this for hobby stuff, no. Uh, there are, as I say, there are cheaper alternatives to this, ones that you can buy that don't have as fancy a rig and they're a little bit more expensive. They're still expensive, because this is, you know, this is expensive, it's, it's precision gear, it's flash stuff. Um, so, uh, but yeah, it's, it's, by the time you set yourself up with one of these, you are, you, you're leaving the realms of hobby and starting to get into the realms of professionals. So, um, you have to really seriously think about how much you're going to use it if you're going to buy one of these microscopes. But I've, oh, I love them. Absolutely love them. Just allow, it enables you to, uh, do so much. All right. So we have a fuse in place now. I'm expecting this to work this time. Um, still need to get a soldering station yet, but the $800 multimeter I need for unit is a bit more important at the moment. Why an $800 multimeter? What does it do, for goodness sake? Um, I mean, I've got to say, this is the multimeter that I use, and it is a, <laughs> it is a Fluke 115. And I'm telling you, this is a nice multimeter. Now, it's expensive, but it's nice. Um, but $800, my goodness, my goodness. Um, now, of course, if you are looking for a budget soldering station, if you have a look in the, my des the description uh, of this video, you will actually find a budget soldering iron option there. And it's one that I highly recommend. As I say, it uses these T12 tips that you can buy for the, if you can buy knockoff tips or you can buy genuine hacko tips. They will work in the soldering iron that I've got there. And they are, these, these tips are the things that make that soldering iron really, really good. They heat incredibly quickly, the temperature is accurate, etc., etc. Right, sorry, I am really dragging this last bit out, aren't I? All right, so we have now got the mouse back in. Um, we have got uh, these at Emu back in. Um, I have got, some power that I'm ready to apply and I'm being super careful. And then, are we ready? That's the sound we like to hear. That is the sound of the computer starting up. Now we've got our little brightness control here at the front. Oh, look at that firing up into the old, uh, in the operating system. We can see we've got some geometry issues here. It's a little bit squeezed out. So I'm gonna play around with that later on and get that so that it's actually filling the, the screen. But uh, there we go, it beeped, uh, and this is the VZ EMU, and it's actually showing up here what's loaded up, and it's saying HD20 plus, oh, so HD20 disk emulation, Mac plus, 96 megabytes. So I've created a little, sort of essentially 100 megabyte disk image, and I've just got a few little bits of the old software on there. I don't think there's much on there at the moment. I think it's mainly just for testing, but we can go on and go about, oh no. Uh, there we go, system 6, 608, which, uh, you know, for those who uh, are not familiar with the old 6.8, I mean, it was, I think it's, if, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it's the last system 6, um, after 608 came 7. Uh, oh, look at this, I've got uh, a few applications, I've got Civilization on here, uh, a little Mac 3D application, I've got... Uh, Probably got Mac Paint and stuff on here, but anyhow, applications, there we go. Um, how much memory does it have installed? That's a good question, I didn't look. About the finder. Yeah, one megabyte. 
Yes, uh, Rob would know because this is his computer. He is the one in there under the name Samplers. And so uh, this is actually his computer. So yeah, he would know how much RAM is in there. As I say, this can take uh, four. Um, let me just, uh, uh, hello Trina. Um, you've missed all of the fun stuff, I'm afraid. We're, um, it's working. Um, so, okay, so that's all good. That's working now. Just before I sign off, this I will only take me a second. I just wanted to demonstrate something here very quickly, but essentially that's working. As I say, I will go in and I'll test the voltage coming out of this to make sure that it's it's good. Um, and you, as I say, you can make a minor adjustment with the little uh, sort of uh, little sort of uh, trim pots on the uh, analog board. I will adjust the geometry so that it uh, you know fits the screen properly. Um, and I will, um, and yeah, that's, and then I'll probably just give it a bit of a, a bit of a clang, but that basically is all sorted. So we've replaced that caps, those caps, it's working. Uh, we've done a few little steps to try and future proof it. Um, and, and that's pretty much it. But very quickly, what I'm going to do, I'm going to just whip out the analog board. So I'm just going to do that now. Ouch. Sorry. Analog board. Whip out the logic board. Boy, brain's not working today, is it? Ugh. Sorry, my sound probably went crackle then, because crackle, 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 pop. There we go. I think I need to replace that cable. What do you reckon? Um, let's move this out of the way, and let's just get this. So this is just one last thing I'm going to do here before I sign off, and let Steve take over and do his stream, which, of course, I will be present there. So everyone, don't forget... After this stream, jump across and watch Steve. If you haven't already subscribed to his channel, he's Mac84, subscribe to his channel. You've been told. Um, right, so let's just go here to Microscope Big. And I just wanted to show, oh, well, actually, this is, this is a bit mean of me. I should do this first. Here is the logic board. This is an exciting old logic board of the Mac Plus. What you've got down here, this big wide chip, this is the 68000 or 68K chip right there. That's the uh, CPU right there. Uh, and then we have, oh, oh, you can, it's also, the RAM down here. And as you can see, what we have is four 256K SIMs. That would have been the most popular configuration you would have got this computer in. You would have had four 256K. Now, obviously, you can replace those 256K and put in one megabyte, one megabyte seems to take it up to four. That is the maximum of this one. Uh, okay, so Steve has to eat dinner and then he'll do his stream. So there will be a pause. Won't be right after this. But I'm sure if you, um, you know, sort of subscribe to his channel, you'll get a notification from YouTube because YouTube notifications never fail. Um, so that's, as I say, this is you know, 4 times 256 giving you one megabyte. Now, what's really interesting about these is if you want to upgrade the RAM, you've actually got to cut a resistor on this logic board, for those of you who may not be aware of it. And when you compare that to upgrading RAM these days, you basically just take out the old SIMs and put the new ones on. So I'm just going to quickly show you this under the microscope, uh, like this. And we move up to here, and you'll see here R8 and R9. There's R8 and there's R9. And you have here a little resistor running across 256K bit. And then you have no resistor under one row. Now, one row is so if you, for example, wanted to run this as a one megabyte machine with one single one megabyte SIM, that's where you would have a resistor there. If you're running this with 256K SIMs, that resistor needs to be there. If you are wanting to upgrade it to one megabytes, you literally have to cut this resistor so it's not connected. Now, I will remove it. What, what a lot of people do, certainly what I do as well, is you cut one end. I'm not going to do this, but you cut one end and then you just bend the resistor up to break contact. And that just means that if some stage in the future you maybe wanted to restore it to its original, you can... Um, bend that resistor back down and do a little solder bridge of where the cut is. So, um, so yeah, that's, that's basically the thing with, uh, with upgrading these. And I can see here that we've got a, a bit of a ROM upgrade going on here because these are, these aren't original. No, sir. 
Um, so we've had a ROM upgrade to this one here. <clears throat> it's very, very dusty. Uh, I might end up putting this logic board into the ultrasonic cleaner because again, just sort of future proofing, like to make sure these things uh, can last as long as possible. Um, and I am, I am assuming, hoping maybe that this might get upgraded into a four megabyte machine one day. Um, but that is pretty much it. Um, you know, looking at the back, I actually have a Macintosh Plus teardown video in my channel from eight years ago, something like that. Um, it's a long time ago, and it is, uh, it's sort of one of my highest watched videos, um, where, you know, sort of just basically me pulling one of these apart. So if you have interest in the Mac Plus and you'd like to know a little bit more about it, feel free to jump onto that old video. But just do keep in mind that it's a very old video. Uh, it may not have the, some of the uh, fancy stuff that I put in my videos these are days. Um, okay, mind sending me the serial number for that machine after the stream? I do not mind that at all. In fact, here's a little plug for Jay. Uh, Apple serial, put in a link if you would, Jay. Uh, if you have a modern Mac, and in the future, vintage Macs as well, that's the plan. If you have a modern Mac and you want to know a little bit more about it, you can get that serial number, you can enter it into that website, and it will spit up all sorts of information about your computer, not just the information you get from every Mac. You get a lot more information about it than you would if you were to do the same thing on the every Mac website. So jump onto Jay's website if you want to look up information about your computer. Uh, AppleSerialNumberInfo.com uh, and it, uh, as I say, gives you information with serial numbers. If you're wondering what the noise is, it's pissing with rain outside, which means that I'm going to get absolutely drenched when I walk back into the house. So isn't that great? Um, all right, folks. Well, I think that's pretty much it. I think we can wrap it up now. Um, a successful, we repaired it. I, I didn't think there would be a problem. Generally, with those old Mac buses, they're pretty reliable. So when you, uh, you know, if you do have a, re a reefer cap that goes, you replace them, and then you're uh, you're good to go. Um, and I think this Mac Plus is ready to go for another thirty years, thirty five, thirty, thirty ish, something something years. And so thank you to everyone for jumping onto the stream. Um, I uh, appreciate your company and I will be streaming again in the not too distant future because I have got so many repairs here that I figured I'd stream a few of them. Um, and, um, and, uh, and that's pretty much it. So once again, uh, thank you for watching and I will see you at the next one. Goodbye all. Thanks for watching.